Okay, so um, we'll see if we can uh, manage to both uh, handle some of the audience questions. I know um, some of the speakers answered some uh, specific questions already. So we'll get to as many audience questions as possible, but also wanna to try to uh, have some uh, discussion here with multiple panelists on some of the subjects that we covered because uh, I think there's some interesting overlaps between um, the, particularly the, um, the challenges in software, um, both on scaling and, and performance. Um, so I'm going to start off with a couple specific questions and then I'll uh, we'll dive into hopefully ones that uh, address multiple people here. Um, Dennis, I think we could probably spend a whole session talking about your programming model, um, but uh, I wanted to make sure I understood the inner chip communications because you mentioned synchronous messaging and the global address space. So I wonder if you could just briefly explain your chip to chip communications uh, scheme. Sure, I'd be glad to. So, so the chip to chip scheme um, uses uh, really kind of a, a new technique for us. This is this is taking kind of uh, conventional plesiochronous links, and that is they're they're largely pseudo synchronous. They're almost synchronous, and it's it's uh, they're, they're synchronous with with uh, within the tolerance of the crystals that are driving their their links. And so we we devised a a uh, a mechanism to essentially de-skew those links so that we can keep them all in um, in the maintain the illusion of that synchronous behavior across the entire system. And so that was one key piece of IP that we needed to uh, essentially develop to be able to support this kind of synchronous communication model. And and really the intent was to be able to efficiently support. Uh, synchronous stochastic gradient descent, so that when you're you're doing this kind of global exchange or hardware, you know, barrier synchronization across the entire machine, you can do so without incurring uh, a, a, a bunch of waiting time for the barrier synchronization to complete. Um, so, so that is is a key a key to the the way we do uh, networking is is maintaining this kind of pseudo synchronous behavior. And we needed to uh, uh, augment the instruction set to include these kind of de-skew instructions that allow us to, uh, in effect, keep 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 everything uh, operating synchronously. Okay, thanks, Dennis. And uh, Labisha, I saw an audience question. I had the same question um, regarding um, uh, uh, parallelism across. Uh, wormhole devices. Do you support model parallelism across multiple devices? Um, absolutely. We do on both Grayskull and wormhole. Uh, the main difference being that Grayskull is a trip that uh, does not implement any dedicated scale out links. So it's a PCI device and any, any cross trip communication has to tunnel over PCIe. That's answering another question that, that uh, I think uh, Ritika asked and uh, Whereas on wormhole, we we have the ability to to set up more flexible uh, topologies and like via the fact that we integrate this network switch and, and network endpoints, uh, we can there's much more bandwidth and much more flexibility as how you interconnect them. But in both cases, our compiler is able to find solutions where a model is partitioned between uh, multiple devices and understanding the kind of communication link that exists between the devices and it doesn't assume that it's just going to be seven, you know, multiple copies of the model of getting, getting a split data set. It can uh, intelligently divide the model uh, and optimize across devices. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, Whaley, I wanted to understand, you, you said, you know, if there's one slide uh, people should take away, it was your, your software stack. So um, I want to make sure I understand a couple of things about the software stack. Um, so the, the open Vino inference engine that sits on top of the one DNN API, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and so the open Vino, I believe has device specific plugins. So does that mean that one DNN is device type agnostic? I mean, where sort of where in your stack is the um, sort of device specific uh, um, knowledge, yeah. I guess? 
So, so, so um, at this point, there's still a evolution, right? Uh, uh, one DNN was a library which we designed for quite a few years now. The concept of one API came out only very recently. Actually, we just uh, published back uh, uh, um, uh, 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 earlier earlier this month. Um, so, so you seem to know a lot about uh, OpenVINO. So within OpenVINO, we do have different plugins. There's a plugin for CPU, there's a plugin for GPU, there's a plugin for, for FPGA as well. So today, uh, the one DNA library is inside these plugins. And uh, so, so we have a we have a one DNA inside the CPU plugin, and we have a, a one DNA inside the GPU plugin. Now, uh, over time, you can think about various different level of abstractions here. So, so, so ev effectively, the the architectural specific stuff. Our our goal is to be all under the uh, one API uh, one API interface, and then you can have different plugins to uh, different uh, uh, software on top of us. Meaning, could be OpenVINO could be you know PyTorch, could be TensorFlow. So that will be the model we're looking at here. And we will continue to uh, evolve the one DNA interface as well. And traditionally it has been more of a, a, a primitive interface. And now we actually uh, uh, have been designing more of a graph interface because particularly for the for the accelerators, uh, the primitives alone are not sufficient. They want to have a graph. Uh, so you can think of a graph compiler uh, baked in over here. Okay. Thank you. I think I got that. Um, so um, Stan brought up a subject that uh, I think is really important um, in the context of this uh, um, session, and that is uh, compiler generality. So Stan, I did want to circle back to you first um, and understand what what is it about your software design that enables the compiler generality that's allowing you to support uh, you know so many different models. Uh, that's a that's a great question. Uh, so we've uh, we've done a lot of upfront work of uh, analyzing the many different workloads and uh, uh, coming up with uh, the list of uh, instructions and operations and so on that go across everything else, um, and then uh, try to map that into uh, implementation of, of our library and C kernels. So it's really the the breadth of the, the instruction set and the flexibility of our hardware that allows us to very easily bring up all those instructions. Uh, and then after that, uh, the deep integration into a framework like PyTorch uh, gives us that next step and, and the ability to, to fall back on instructions uh, that we haven't implemented yet uh, to kind of give us that uh, ability to run anything. Uh, and then for customers, you know, that see a lot of fallbacks to CPU, we can always uh, uh, come out and implement those instructions on hardware later. Uh, to boost the performance further. Uh, but generality was always the, the first and main goal, uh, meaning anything you throw at it runs uh, and then performance is tuned over time afterwards. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Wei Li mentioned a lot of the vision processing and, you know, heavy gem. And I think we've seen a lot of chips that are really kind of <laughs> designed very, um, very specifically for vision processing. And, and then things sort of break down when you start looking at um, you know, BERT and these other models. So Wei Li, it seems like with Intel having so many different architectures, there has to be some tension here between kind of uh, generality and optimization. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, having to support all these different architectures, how you approach this problem. Yeah, so so I think that the, the beauty of a, a big company like Intel is we can actually do a variety of things, and and we do have uh, you know all the way from from a very general purpose, which is CPU, and to still very general purpose with GPU, and all the way to uh, to specific uh, uh, acceleration like the Habana side and the VPU, and all the way to I didn't even talk about uh, GNA, which is another. Uh, AI chip we, we, we designed for uh, speech uh, speech only. Uh, so yeah, so this is a uh, there's a tension is also benefits to cover a large amount of uh, uh, different platforms here. And uh, so so even within the company, we you know quite often I think it's it's probably a a, a rich man's problem because we have so many things and we have to figure out how to position between these different things here, right? Uh, so from 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 uh, uh, a software team, um, you know, we, we are the software team here. From software team perspective, our goal is to make sure we can run everything well, 
right? Because uh, because certain things may run well on one particular like vision. You know, vision applications will run very well, very power efficiently on the on our you know Movidis VPU, for example, right? The the speech thing will be running very well on our GNA, right? Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we have customers who who want to be able to run all kinds of things, right? Like like today they want to run some recommendation system. Tomorrow, they also want to run some vision thing on top of this. So that's where the general purpose uh, hardware like uh, uh, CPU and GPU can be useful here. Uh, so so it's, um, it's, it's been a fun, fun thing to do uh, to develop software for a wide range of uh, different architectures. Yeah, I, I like your rich man's problem. It's, uh, <laughs> I guess, a luxury to have a team of uh, your size to address these problems. Um, Dennis, I wanted to circle back to you on the issue of um, model parallelism. Um, if, if I understand it right, your compiler has to generate code for up to eight TSPs running in parallel. Is that correct? That, that, that's right. So, so the node is organized as, as eight TSPs, and, and there can be up to 64 TSPs in a rack. Um, so the compiler uh, organizes uh, the, the code, structures the code, uh, to, to generate those individual artifacts for the individual TSPs to run in parallel. Okay, um, and just circling back on this issue of, of generality, um, do you have anything to add in terms of how uh, Grok sort of approached this problem? Yeah, I, I was gonna jump in and say, you know, generality is a, is a bit overrated, I feel like. We're, we're really designing domain-specific processors, right? And it's really to take advantage of the kind of communication patterns and the traffic intensities, the ALU intensities that we see in these kind of machine learning codes. So, so I'm unabashedly uh, uh, very domain specific in that if you have a vector problem, choose a vector processor. If you have a tensor problem, choose a tensor processor. This is kind of a, a basic idea. And, and, and when all you have is a GPU, it's kind of like the old adage, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when all you have is a GPU, everything starts to look like a triangle on a polygon. And, and we're really designing the, the tensor streaming processor to be a, a, uh, a domain specific processor. We leave the, the things that the CPU is really good at, branchy code and, and uh, uh, speculation and aggressive out of order execution. We do that in the scalar processor and we provide a very fast coprocessor that allows us to do um, the deep neural networks. For example, ResNet 50, a forward pass of ResNet 50 in less than 50 microseconds. Okay. We Thanks. feel there's significant advantage to, to being domain specific. Yeah, I mean, certainly we see, um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll have more sessions talking about the edge. I think we, we'll see more specialization in the edge, but on the other hand, on the data center side, um, there are certainly use cases where customers need, a, need to be able to support a wide range of models, some of which haven't even been created yet. So. Um, Another interesting aspect of this um, that both Whaley and Stan mentioned is the ability to handle interleaving multiple devices. And I think Stan mentioned it in the context of PyTorch. Um, Whaley, you mentioned it uh, in the context of OpenVINO, I think. Um, uh, Whaley, I'll start with you. Can you compare and contrast sort of OpenVINO and PyTorch approaches to interleaving? Uh, okay, so. Um... On the, uh, I'm not that familiar with the, with the PyTorch interleaving over there, so I'll just comment on the, on the OpenVINO side. So on the OpenVINO side, we do, um, you know, we do, do send different tasks to, to different queues uh, in parallel, and that has been uh, working out uh, very straight, it's very straightforward for us actually. Um, and we're getting good performance by looking at both together versus one, each of them separately. And that's done dynamically in the inference. It's done that dynamically, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can balance, you can sort of load balance between the CPU and the GPU. Yeah, for yeah, example. yeah, yeah. And and uh, you know, and when we when we have more devices coming, in, we can do even more beyond that. And that that particular thing, you know, we, we plan to do. I mean, not only just open you know, we plan to do in other other places as well. So. Okay. Um, Stan, you want to jump in here and explain um, how that works in the context of PyTorch? 
Uh, well, it's a very, very similar approach where at, uh, at the compile time, uh, uh, PyTorch can sort of uh, query the, the support levels of the device to, to understand what, uh, what we want to run on hardware and what we don't, uh, and breaks up the wall uh, appropriately. Uh, so that it's really uh, a completely a choice to a far compiler on on what we want to run on the device, what we want to leave on the CPU. Um, I do want to mention that you know our goal is to to run everything on on our hardware and then continue to add uh, more support for this. But this is a a great way to fall back on you know the occasional kind of onesie twosie instructions that uh, uh, maybe we don't have yet. Uh, right. and it's, not really designed for uh, uh, for any kind of load balancing or, or anything like that. Okay. Um, I, I know there are a lot of audience questions and we're not going to get to them all, but I do want to bring up um, one I've seen multiple times here to start with. Um, so for both Tenstar and, and Grok, and I'll start with you, Dennis. Um, there's a question about ML perf uh, numbers and whether you plan to publish those. A great question. So yes, we do. We we were hoping to uh, to publish it at, at the next uh, uh, iteration. Um, unfortunately, kind of COVID did get in the way a little bit. So we're 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 working through that to to resource it and to be able to publish our results for uh, ResNet and NLP uh, among others. Okay, um, Labisha, you want to tackle that one? Uh, yes, it's it's a very similar answer. So. We want it uh, to, to publish uh, results even in the last submission. Um, unfortunately, we just weren't ready in time. So we're, we're aiming for, for the next round and uh, that work is already ongoing. Okay, thank you. Breakouts, um, yep, more questions on ML perf. <laughs> um, uh, here's an interesting one. Um, Waylee, maybe you can comment briefly. I know it's kind of a roadmap issue and not something that's shipping, but maybe you can comment briefly on where you see AMX fitting um, in future Intel CPUs. Yeah, so so AMX uh, will be in our next generation, which is called uh, Sapphire, Sapphire Rapids. Uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, sometime next year. So, so, so it's coming out very quickly. And uh, you know, it's it's it going to be a as I show in the slide, it's going to be a huge jump uh, into the compute. So when people think about acceleration, this is MX because of AMX. This really looking like a you know a lot of the accelerator that people are building. And so, so, so I, I do think there's a room. Uh, as we're doing today, you know, for general purpose CPU to GPU to uh, accelerators uh, targeting a narrow, narrow uh, domains there. Um, but uh, but but in order, you know, there's a there's a, a hierarchy, right? Uh, and uh, so we are covering more general side, and the the narrow peak side will be covered by the acceleration side. But but because we are adding more and more compute capability inside CPU, so so the barrier for accelerators are going to be higher and higher because you really need to be you know need to be more than 10x better than baseline cpu because otherwise it's going to be very difficult okay thanks um dennis I, I think i mentioned you could probably do an entire talk on your programming model and maybe um during your breakout session you can point people to some resources um, for further reading um but one question that came up multiple times was the issue of branching um, and how that works in your architecture. So maybe you could briefly address that. Sure, I'd be, I'd be glad to. Um, so so the, the, most of these, these chips operate on a, a static compute graph and um, we, we support a static computational graph, but we also handle dynamic computational graphs as well as um, the, the, basically the way we handle conditionals is, is with predication. So there's built-in hardware support for predication and you basically execute both halves of, of the branch and discard the one that you're not using. So um, it, it's, uh, it's a pragmatic uh, choice toward, toward uh, you know, using hardware resources and keeping latency low and keeping complexity low. So, so the way that we handle, and handle that is, is through predication. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. 
Um, one last topic I want to bring up here before we go to the breakouts is the issue of sparsity. I think Stan mentioned conditionals. Um, you know, sparsity, I guess, from our perspective, has had some negative connotations with regards to accuracy, um, although some of that, I think, is architecture dependent. So, um, Stan, I'm going to start off with you because, uh, you know, you didn't have much time to, to um, get into this, but the, you brought up the issue of conditionals and the fact that spart linear sparsity isn't offsetting the growth and the size of the models. Um, can you just um, kind of reiterate your point there and, and what you think is needed um, that differs from the kind of sparsity that's being implemented today? Uh, thanks. That's a great question. Actually, Yubish has done a lot of uh, recent work on this, so I'm going to punt this question to him and uh, okay. give a, a much more detailed answer there. So let me ju ju just double check. I got the question right. So did, did you want to comment on the issue of, of accuracy or just kind of general commentary on, on sparsity and, and uh, how that can be beneficially used? Well, um, Stan specifically mentioned conditional, so I'm interested in what you see in terms of the sort of the future, I guess, of sparsity versus the fairly, what seems like fairly um, um, low granularity sparsity that's being implemented today. Right, so, so I guess um, the, the way that uh, dynamic sparsity as we talk about it and, and conditionals intersect is that we've really been trying to bring up mechanisms in which you can take uh, a primitive, like a fully connected matrix layer, where by default, it's something that uh, essentially implements a matrix multiplication by a vector or by a matrix, depending on whether you're, you know, you know you're batched or no, and turn it into something that uh, selectively performs subset of that computation based on uh, uh, based on some heuristics, right? And they, they could be entirely model driven, they could be uh, you know, completely separate from the model and implemented as, as observing the data as, as you're computing. And in, in, in this kind of uh, scenario, the conditionals essentially uh, manifest as um, an ability to determine at runtime uh, either which sections or weights you would like to use. So think of it as runtime dynamic pruning uh, on a per input basis. So you look at an input and you say, well, you know, for this input, I'm not going to, I'm not going to run the full matrix multiply. I'll only, uh, I'm going to select a subset of weights uh, using hopefully good criteria and only run those. Or else um, uh, a similar approach is to choose which outputs you, you will generate, right? Again, again, similarly in a dynamic way. So instead of generating the full output matrix, you, you select subsections and forego others. So the holy grail for this is if you're able to set up chains of such computations where you see sparsity at the input of such layers and you're producing sparsity at the output, uh, this is the, these two combined give you uh, the ability to basically take a complexity of a, of a matrix multiplication from, a, from an N cubed with the dimension of the matrix to, to N, which is really what we need in order to, to kind of continue following the desires of machine learning workloads within the confines of Moore's law, right? So we we've done a, a lot of uh, a lot of work, uh, basically both in taking existing networks, things like ResNet 50, BERT, and uh, finding ways to automatically apply this kind of mechanism. So with no no model change, no you know no burden on on the original designers. It's something that can be deployed on existing models, as well as uh, studying you know new models that you could build if you had tools like this. And uh, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, a, a very sort of rough sense for, for where we landed. And that's that you can take a model like bird base and bird large, it's the same kind of, uh, same kind of result. And, and uh, these are really representative of many other models we've looked at. And remove, uh, you can basically ma make these layers on the order of three quarters sparse with uh, zero impact to the quality of results with no required change to, to the model code. And then uh, by virtue of the fact that it's a quadratic speed game um, and not, not a linear one, you end up eliminating uh, basically 15, 15 over 16 of the flops required in the model. So these are really very, very, very dramatic changes, right? Like, and, and this is the reason that uh, ultimately our belief is that despite the fact that, you know, we've built good machinery and good software to target it. And today's talk was, was primarily focusing on that software, right? 
uh, really the most promising thing and the one that's actually going to make impact on, on the machine learning community um, is this dynamic sparsity, other types of conditionals. And um, this is why we felt that uh, the requisite complexity in supporting this kind of fine-grained conditionals in a way that's less performance uh, impacting than, than predication was warranted, right? So as a company, this is really what we're about. Okay, thank you for that um, uh, thorough answer. I think uh, it's a very interesting area of research. Um, uh, Wei Li, do you have anything to add on what Intel is doing in this uh, in regards to sparsity across your different architectures? Yeah, so so uh, we are we are certainly very interested in sparsity as uh, everybody else, and in the variety of different machines we have, in, uh, uh, we had a a. Uh, uh, we had a product which actually supported uh, sparsity already, uh, which is called Spring Hill, uh, for uh, for uh, inference only, and, and we also looking into sparsity for our future generations as well for for a variety of different architectures. Uh, so this is a is a very interesting area to us. Okay, thank you.